Well, today we, uh, we have a gift, really. Uh, uh, our, my good friends, our good friends here at Newbridge, uh, Rick and Tammy Romano, are here uh, to speak to us, to share what's going on in the Dominican Republic, uh, uh, where they serve at the Ministry of the Community of Hope. Uh, Rick and Tammy, uh, I met them first uh, in 2007. So we're going on 17 years of friendship, and I had no idea that we would become such good friends and, and long uh, years-long ministry partners. Rick and Tammy, why don't you make your way up uh, front? Um, and so I, I first uh, led a trip at the church, from the church down the street there in Chatham. Uh, they were serving in Mexico with their four children, John, Rebecca, Abby, and Mariah. And uh, in fact, the twins, the youngest, were four or five years old when I first met them. They were same same age as my Abby. And uh, one of them's getting married in a couple months, right? So things have changed. The years have uh, passed. And um, But these are my dear friends. Come on closer. Come on. You don't have to be. <laughs> these are my dear friends. Uh, they serve in the Dominican Republic now. Uh, when you hear about the stuff that's going on in the ministry there, it's really quite amazing. Uh, these folks are servants, uh, chief servants. Uh, they model love and compassion and care and, and leadership and uh, the gospel to, uh, the, to, to everybody. And so uh, I just want to take a moment to pray for them before they come up and share with us. Father, I pray for a fresh anointing. I pray that you would uh, fill uh, uh, Tammy and, and Rick with your spirit, that you'd give them the strength this morning to, to bring your word and bring this message, this challenge to us here at Newbridge Church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank welcome. You. Welcome. Thank welcome. You. Well, good morning, church. Good day. Little, little cool outside, right? The third row, it's really cold. So if you're hot, uh, third row is a good place because I think, you know, it blows this way. So that's why it was an open spot. Nobody was sitting there, right? Is that why? I don't know, but man. Uh, anyway, do we have that first slide up? Brian, you said that these guys were going to be on it, and so far they're behind. I'm kidding up there. Hey, this is our family, so Tim mentioned that uh, we do have four kids, and uh, so maybe you might be thinking now there's more than just four kids in that picture. So, you know, I'm not very good at math, but I do know uh, that there are extra people in there. So the one that's uh, standing next to me, uh, you know, is uh, that's Mariah, and her friend <laughs> is beside her. Uh, so his name is Eli, and uh, they get married September, September 28th, and so pray, pray, uh, pray for me, <laughs> pray for Eli, maybe, because he's coming into the family, so whether I like it or not at this point, right? So anyway, uh, and then uh, Rebecca is here, she's sitting in the third row. She loves it in the third row because it's nice and cool over there. She goes, wow, this is nice. And then uh, Abigail is right beside Rebecca and uh, my mom. And then John. Uh, John's back home. Working. Trying to work anyway, so... He works alongside of us. Anyway, my mom passed last week. <laughs> Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. Lord, I pray that you would speak Speak in us and through us. Lord, uh, I pray for your hand of protection upon us. I pray that you would give us the words. Continue, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, come and fall fresh on us in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. How many of us live in the past? Right? That question that... Uh, came up, how much time do you spend in a day 
thinking about the past? How much time do you spend thinking about tomorrow or next week or next month? Uh, I, you know, I don't know about you, but this, uh, this last week I've had some great memories, great thoughts. But how much time do you spend in a day thinking about, well, if I would have done that, or if I would have done this, you know, driving down, uh, you know, the turnpike or the garden state and uh, you're on your phone. Not that you would do it. (laughs) But in the Dominican Republic, I spend a bit of time when I'm driving on my phone and, uh, you know, things happen, right? But then you start thinking, well, only if I would have done this or only if I would have done that. Over the past couple of years, the Christian Missionary Alliance, part of the denomination that, that, that this church belongs to, has said, hey, we, wanna, we want our missionaries to talk about being present. What does it mean to be present? Uh, you know, for us, we're going to share some stories about being present. And so I wanted to, to talk to you about being present. And, and so uh, last year, I started to, to formulate this, this message, and I started to look at, uh, you know, you just type in being present in Google, and uh, this, The Time Paradox is a book by Zimbardo and, and Boyd, and they talk about the time perspectives to change the way we live. You know, if you've never thought about Uh, you know, how much time you spend thinking about the past or the future, Uh, you know, oh, I'm just going to live life as the way I should. You know, probably you're spending a lot of time not being in the present. Because if we are, uh, we need to be thinking through, it's, it's now. We need to live in the now, not Uh, You know, so many of us spend time thinking about what we've done or about the past and we're never in the present. It's how we end up overthinking things, right? You know, only if I would have done this or only if I would have done that. Darius Faroe talks about the 1, 9, and 90 principle of time. Uh, The awareness of being able to uh, to be in the present. And so the time perspective, 24 hours in a day, does anybody put your phones down or don't go to your calculator? How many minutes are in a day? Anybody? I, I did the math this morning, okay? 1,440 minutes in a day. So the 1, 9, and 90 uh, principle. So 1%, he says, uh, uh, Darius Faroe says, that we should spend 1% focused on the past. 1% of, of 100. 1% of 1,440 minutes. That's just under 15 minutes. 15 minutes thinking about the past. And not thinking about the past, but uh, spend time if you, if you journal. Spend time journaling about what happened, the past, to reflect on the past. 1%. How much time do we spend on the past? So the nine, one, nine, and 90. The 9% is focusing on the future. 130 minutes dedicated to planning for the future. You know, what are you going to do? But again, we, we spend so much time thinking about the past or about what's coming down uh, the road, and, and you're so focused on that. And then he says, we need to spend 90% of the time, 1,295 minutes, about living in the present. And, and I understand you're going to say, well, where does sleep fit in, Right? So you take the sleep because the sleep is in the present. So I got on a plane at, at midnight in, from Edmonton, Alberta. Not last night, but the night before. And, and uh, you know, flying those red eyes, those aren't very exciting. But I did get some sleep. And so yesterday, I, I landed at JFK. Tammy landed at JFK. We reunited, and, and then we came 
uh, we went to uh, Ewing, where our daughters live, Rebecca and Abigail, and we met up with uh, Mariah, and we went for uh, a late lunch, early dinner, and at the stoplight, I spent about 30 seconds sleeping, and Tammy woke me up. It was like, I was tired. So sleeping does count in this 1,295 minutes, right? How much time do you, do you spend in the present? Uh, the Bible talks a lot about being present. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. David reminds us, to focus on the present. This is the day. And then Matthew 6, verse 11. Jesus taught us how to pray. Give us this day. Right? Matthew 6, verse 34. He also knew that we would struggle. Not, we're not to worry about tomorrow. How many of us, if you're honest, how many of us, worry about tomorrow. And, and for those of you that are older and you have kids, how many of us worry about our children? <laughs> Some of you that have grown children, how many of you worry more about your grown children than, <laughs> yeah, amen. Pray for me. We have four grown children, one here. I am taking resumes for my daughters that are still single. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul didn't want us to be hindered with the past. Forgetting what lies behind. It's all about living in the present. We need to forget the good. We, we can reminisce and we can go, wow, what, amazing, what an amazing day we had yesterday. Or what an amazing week. What an, an amazing life I had with my mom. Amen? Amen. And then Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Amen? Amen. They sold everything and gave it to Rick so that he... No, sorry. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together. In the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, living in the present. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you want to be a part of a church like that? Amen? A church that lives in the present. I mean, that's what it is. Acts chapter 2. A church that is in the present. How? To be able to minister, to be able to live in the present. Mission 2535 comes from Matthew 25, 35, and 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you came to visit me. Wow. Wow. For us, being present means recognizing and acting upon the needs of the people around us. We need to have the eyes and ears to see. And so encouraging for me, for us, to be able to sit here today and to hear the announcement that you're starting a new ministry, a food pantry, living in the present, seeing the needs that are around you. Are there needs? Yes. We need to act upon those needs. We're going to share four aspects of our ministry as we live life in the D Dominican Republic. We're going to share four aspects of that ministry about how we live in the present. And so for us, back in uh, January of 2015, so long ago, 
we sat down with uh, some pastors in the area that we, uh, that we are in now. We sat down with some pastors and, and we started to dream about what we, what we have now today. And we started to, uh, what, what are the areas? Where, what do we need to do? What kinds of things are we looking at? at how can we live out the gospel in this area? And we came up with these four pillars, clean water, food sustainability, education and job training, and dignified health care. And so this map, the map of the Dominican Republic, the, the circle, that's where our community of hope is. We are within 20 minutes of 10 to 15 churches that, uh, that we minister with. We're situated in, in an amazing spot to be able to, uh, to help the rural areas of the Dominican Republic. People are coming to know Jesus because of what's happening out at Community of Hope. It's amazing. You know, I, I used to think years ago as I pastored in, uh, in the States and Canada, we would, uh, people would come by all the time to the church for help. And it was like, why? You know, my, my attitude was, well, why are they coming to the church? at times, because we would get the same people. And so now, when people come by our property, and I'm going, I love it. I love the fact that people come by our property because they know that they can, they can come for that hope that they're looking for. Isn't that amazing? Amen. That, that people can come People that come and knock on the doors of the church here know that they can come for hope. As we're focused on ways that we can reach out in our community, uh, people are coming by the property. They're coming by Community of Hope. Next slide. People come by and ask for uh, basic, the basic needs. We have 10 acres of land, and, and this is our land. Uh, the, the bottom part, that's... Uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that later, but that's our uh, youth rehabilitation uh, center that we're, we're opening up. But 10 acres of land. People always come by looking for jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our property. That's our, our aquaponics, what used to be our aquaponics, but now uh, just a fish farm. Our factory back there, we have a plastic and, and furniture factory, but uh, our the guy that is in the lead of our furniture factory. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the, the furniture that we build. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, Pastor uh, Luis Jose, he got a contract, uh, and this is the first time that he's done this. Usually it's just building furniture like this, a dresser, uh, a, a bedroom suite, two headboards, uh, two nightstands, a headboard and a footboard, and, and a dresser. And that's what, that's what they've sold for the last five, six years. And now he got a contract to finish an apartment building. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow is right. We're excited about that. And, and to be able, there is so much construction going on. Next slide. This is one of uh, the young men that work uh, with us. And uh, so exciting to see uh, that what's going on. So Pastor Luis Jose has taken uh, young men off the street to be able to uh, give them a trade. And so this is one of uh, our young men. His dad's one of our pastors. Uh, uh, but just to be able to speak into the lives of our workers. And so Pastor Luis, uh, there was one time I went into the factory early. They didn't know that I was going to show up early. And I went there. And, and these guys, there's about eight guys sitting in the back of, of the furniture factory. And I thought, what are you guys doing sitting down? It's first thing in the morning. And, and then as I get closer, he's doing Bible study with them. I was like, oh, man. You know, it always doesn't, it's not always what you think it is, right? And so it's like, okay, that's great. But again, he's doing this. It's, it's a ministry, but it's also, you know, we're there to make some profit so that we can do other things with the ministry. Next slide, please. And so this is inside our factory. Those are the bedroom suites that, uh, that they make. And I always say uh, that the furniture that we make, it, it's uh, good from far, but far from good. It's kind of like Ikea furniture, right? 
And so it, it looks great, and it's very well made, but it's, uh, uh, don't get it wet, right? You know what I'm saying? It's the, uh, it's the MDF, so if it gets wet anyway. Uh, so they do an, an amazing job. Next slide. This is uh, Pastor Luis Jose. Uh, look at those muscles that he's got. Man, you know, so I've uh, gone on a diet, and I'm still a little bigger than him, but anyway. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the other things that we do is the plastic recycling. We buy, uh, Tammy's going to talk a little bit about this, but this is the mound of plastic that uh, we grind up. So uh, our, uh, we have two factories, and, and again, part of what we do is to uh, get some revenue so that we can plant churches, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, but we buy this from the dump or from other places. And then, uh, next slide, this is Pastor uh, Yere. And he's, uh, he's got a team of three other guys. They, they go through this plastic and, and they classify it, separate it, separate it into colors. And next slide. And then they put it in sacks like this and we sell it back to the plaster, uh, plastic manufacturers. And then when all that plastic stuff breaks again, uh, you know, we'll buy it from the people at the dump, uh, reclassify it and sell it back to them again. But it's a way for us to be able to generate uh, revenue so that we can plant churches. Amen? Amen. Next slide. Uh, we have people coming by our property uh, to buy furniture, to work in the furniture factory, uh, to sell plastic to us, to, to get a job. Uh, we also have people coming by our uh, property, and it is in a rural area, probably really similar to this. There's, uh, you know, where your church is, it's rural, and, and then there's a church. Well, in our area, it's, it's all rural, and then there's 10 acres of land, and we've got all this stuff, and we have a vocational technical school. And so the first year, we had three, over 300 people graduate. Uh, COVID did a real number on us, and we haven't been able to, uh, to get back to what it was before, but we're starting, uh, the government is starting to send us teachers. Please pray that we would be able to get, we have a stack of applications. It's not for the lack of people wanting to come and to learn. Uh, right now, it's the government won't give us the teachers that we need. So we're part of a government program where we provide the students and the space and the government provides the teachers. And I've asked our team on the ground, do we need to look at maybe going on our own? And the cool thing with the program that we're a part of is that they get a certificate at the end. They graduate, and then they can use that certificate to get, an, uh, to, uh, to get a job. And so pray for us with the vocational technical school. I think we have four classes that, are, uh, that have just started up in the last month. So next slide. Uh, people come by our property because I said they were looking for hope. Could you imagine living in a house in the Caribbean like this? where when you're inside, you can see daylight through the wood. And so we've started to build houses for people who are in need. Uh, next slide. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. What was that? Uh, Ty Rennington? Is that his name? Pennington. Move that bus, right? Go back one slide, please. Can you reverse it? There. From that to... That, amazing, wow. amazing. And so uh, these last two weeks, my guys have been, uh, so uh, my guys will put the floor in and the blocks. And when a team comes, they put up the house in a week. Wow. So uh, my guys take about two weeks to put the floor and the block in because I think they sit down when I'm not there. <laughs> I'm kidding. Takes them a lot longer to do block and, and concrete, but then to be able to walk away on a Friday and to give them the keys, and then a couple weeks later, we'll do a house dedication. It's amazing. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people, we've built 26, 28 homes over these, uh, the last five years, and to be able to see you know, and, and we don't decide who gets these houses, the pastors, our team on the ground now. We have about 20 to 23 employees that work with us, uh, you know, and, and uh, just to be able to see them uh, come to know Jesus 
through a simple house, a house that costs us $7,000. Money well spent when a family comes to know Jesus. For us, being present means showing God's love in practical ways in order to establish trust, building relationships that will lead to starting to sharing the gospel in hardest areas. A little over nine years ago, we started visiting a local dump. The idea was to buy plastic from them. There are 50 men and women that are working at this dump. And their, their job is to pull out the recyclables out of the garbage. So they get plastic, uh, cardboard, glass, metal, and earn right around $100 a week. So the first time we went to the dump, we brought uh, a group there, brought some apples and ice cold water, shared the gospel with the people there, and they were very much uh, closed to us. They weren't sure who we were, what our purpose was, really had their arms crossed and not really open to us. It started pouring down rain, and I said to the foreman out there, I said, why don't you come back to Community of Hope, see what our vision is, and talk to uh, my husband. So he said, okay. So he came back. And Rick asked him one simple question. What is your greatest need? And he said, we need a shelter from the elements. When it's really, really hot and sunny, they need a place to sit. When it's raining, they also need a place to be able to stay out of the elements. So the following week, Rick brought a team there, and they uh, built a shelter for the people at the dump. And the next time I went to the dump, you could see the walls starting to slowly come down. We decided if we're going to live out Matthew 25, 35, and 36, that we wanted to give them food, but we weren't sure what that was going to look like. How do you give food at a dump? So we came up with sandwiches, chips, cookies, and, of course, ice cold water, always sharing, the te or sharing testimonies and also sharing the gospel with the people out there. We began to see those walls start coming down. We started building relationships. I got to know a couple out there, Santo and Alta Gracia. Didn't take long for Alta Gracia to greet me when I showed up with a great big hug. I didn't care how dirty she was or how she smelled. I was so excited that she would greet me with a hug. When the dump was on fire and they couldn't uh, earn any money because they couldn't dig through the garbage, our team came up with the idea of giving them bags of groceries. So we took care of them. And then the government uh, came in. It changed over and uh, came up with some, uh, a new uh, person that was in charge, a new foreman. So we had to start that relationship all over again. And this all happened during COVID as well. And it seemed like year after year when we were wanting to buy plastic off of the dump so that we could uh, grind it and do the plastic recycling that we talked about, um, it, it seemed like empty promises. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll sell you guys plastic. And then when it came time to buy it, they never followed through with it. We felt like we were being taken advantage of. And even our team came to the part where we were just like, you know what? I don't think we want to work with the dump anymore because um, it's just empty promises. We can find another dump that will sell us plastic. But in my heart, I felt it really isn't about the plastic. It is about the relationships of being present. About a year ago, the presence of God fell on the dump. We started doing worship uh, at the dump. Pastor Enrique actually learned a song in Creole, English, and of course in Spanish. And I can't explain it other than just the beauty of worship in the middle of the garbage. Haitian women dancing, raising their hands, and even some of these men were raising their hands, worshiping God. People were coming to know Christ. In May, in a couple of weeks, the government will shut down that dump, as we know it. They've built their own recycling plant not far from that dump. Some of the workers will be able to relocate and still dig through the garbage that they will have at this plant. Um, I'd ask you to pray for us. I don't know what ministry is going to look like, but the people at the dump have uh, talked to the government, and the government assures us that we're allowed to still go in. Please pray with us that we'll be able to keep that relationship going. Amen. Things change, right? And we don't know what tomorrow will look like, but we're going to go in faith, live in the present, and say, God, uh, it's all about you.
You know, we're coming. We're, we're looking at, at what's uh, ahead. And so over the last nine years, we've walked alongside of the churches that we work with. And uh, so over these last nine years, we've uh, walked alongside eight new church plants that we've uh, helped resource and that we've helped plant in some way or another. If you can go to uh, slide 23. There we, uh, no. Can you go back? Uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Uh, is there another? Go back. Sorry, I should have went through these slides. Next. Next. Yeah, okay, the next one. And the next one. And then we'll go back to those other ones. So April of 2021, in the middle of COVID, uh, Pastor Enrique, who was the National Church President uh, of the Christian Missionary Alliance, was leaving his role as president. And uh, I had asked him, I said, uh, uh, Enrique, what are you going, uh, just FYI, he's John, our son's father-in-law. And so I said, what are you going to do after you live, uh, leave the national office? And he goes, oh, probably plant a church. And, and so I said, okay, uh, we, we could probably help. We've you know, helped plant seven others. And so, and he got all excited. And, and then I said, uh, well, uh, what are you going to do? Because pastors in the, sta- uh, in the States, uh, the churches look after the pastors. Or if you don't, you should, <laughs> Right. And so in the Dominican Republic and other parts around the world, uh, pastors have to have a full-time job. And so Pastor Enrique uh, was looking for a job. And I said, well, do you want to uh, come and work with Mission 2535? Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. And then COVID hit. And I said, just kidding, you know? And then we had some transition. I said, hey, do you want to work? And he goes, okay. So he's now the president of Mission 2535 in the Dominican Republic. And uh, we really are blessed to have him. Uh, uh, to work alongside. Anyway, so he's planted this church in the heart of uh, the Dominican Republic. So if you can go back one slide, this was his inauguration service. And uh, there was uh, probably 150 people. And then the next Sunday, it was his family, our family, and one other, one other family. So three families. And I was like, Wow, that first service, the inauguration was so cool. And then the Sunday after that, it was like, oh, wow, this is going to be tough. But today, uh, there's about 50 to 70 people that call uh, their church home uh, at, at Pastor Enrique's. And he's working the community, going door to door with people in, in uh, that community, uh, praying with people. People are coming to know Jesus because of this new church plant. And so it's been so exciting. A couple years after we moved to the Dominican Republic, so it would have been uh, maybe 11 years ago, we met a family, uh, and, uh, Manuel and Natalia, and they were pastors in one of uh, the cities. Uh, and we just loved that. We loved them. We loved the energy uh, of the church. And the church probably very similar to the energy here uh, at, at your church, at Newbridge. And so really exciting. You walk into church and, and there's young people, there's families, and we're so excited. And so this family, we're starting to get to know them. And then uh, we had uh, our national conference and their son, their 17-year-old son, uh, on a Friday night was hit. Uh, he was driving his motorcycle and was hit and killed. And so that weekend, I can remember uh, on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, going to the hospital in this waiting room. And, uh, uh, you know, the people from the church were in this waiting room just bawling their eyes out, mourning for the loss of this young man. Uh, And so we spent a lot of time with Manuel and Natalia in their home. And uh, one of their other sons, and Manuel, uh, he started working for us. We hired him and was working for us for a few years, was married, and was uh, a pastor at the church with his dad, and uh, really felt the call that God had upon him to be a pastor. And he went to to study, he went to theological training, and he was pursuing full-time ministry. His wife uh, was a doctor, and she got into her specialty and moved two hours away. And within a couple months, uh, they were divorced. And she decided, I, you know, it's not, it's not part of my life. 
And I continued to ask him during this process, are, are you still going to pastor? Because in the Dominican Republic, that doesn't happen. And uh, he, st- he said, I, I still feel called. My calling has not changed. I still feel called to be a pastor. And I said, uh, we, can, we can still walk alongside. And so this last year, uh, next slide, or go back one slide. Remember I said we'd go back, right? So this is Pastor Emmanuel. And so last Sunday was their inaugural uh, service. And so for the last six months, he started uh, doing uh, small groups in the city that they live in. And so Pastor Emmanuel is the guy with the gu- guitar. And just love his heart. Love his heart for the people. And love his heart because it really is. He's got a, an amazing family. His mom and dad, uh, you know, I sat down with Emmanuel and he said, I want to plant the church. I still feel that God has called me. And I said, do your mom and dad know that? And he says, not yet. And I said, before we, we go any further, I said, you need to talk to mom and dad because I don't want to take you away from the church that you are preaching in, that you're serving in, right? And so we had a meeting. We had a pastor come and do some training. And so we invited our pastors in the area to come. And, and about uh, 45 minutes before the meeting started, Manuel and Natalia were there, and I was somewhere on our property, and, and Tammy calls me and says, hey, Manuel and Natalia are here, and they want to talk to you. And I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and Manuel talked to them, and they're going to be mad at me. And so we're outside sitting on a bench, and, and uh, they start crying. And, and they said that I know that the covering from the denomination has been removed from Manuel because he's divorced. And they start crying and, and they say, I, we know that God has his hand upon Manuel and Manuel and that he is called to serve. And they said, thank you so much for believing in him. That we are willing to say, hey, we're walking alongside of you. And so Manuel has planted a church. Pray for him. You know, we believe so strong in, in what we're doing, walking alongside uh, the, the national church. We're not pastoring any church, but we're walking alongside uh, the local church so that they can plant, so that they can uh, look and, and help with the needs that are all around there. Tamara. I never asked. I'm sorry. I never asked what time I need to be done, Tim. I see a clock up there. It's 11.08 and you know, people are starting to get up and walk out, and, and it's like, wow, maybe I'm going too long, I, you know? It says uh, there's yellow numbers, and then there's red numbers, and oh, so keep talking. Can, uh, can you go forward a few slides there? <laughs> Sorry. I'll look this way. <laughs> One more. Right there. That's good. Uh, so a few years ago, we were vi- visiting a men's rehabilitation center, and they had suggested that we uh, visit a youth rehabilitation center that needed help. There are 30 men's facilities in the Dominican Republic, three for women and only one for youth. It's an 18-month program dealing with drugs, alcohol, behavioral, and gambling issues. These kids are from the age of 9 to 18 years old. When we first met them... They, believe it or not, when a drug lord goes to jail, they give these houses that they were in to the rehabilitation center. So they gave this house to a youth rehabilitation center. And, of course, when the drug lord gets out of jail, he wants his house back. And so the drug lord hired some police. The police forcibly removed these boys literally onto the streets with everything they had. And obviously that was very traumatic for them. But because of, this rela- because of this experience, our relationship began to develop. We uh, listened to them. They shared their stories with us, and they started to trust us. We've seen many directors come and go out of the program there. But over the last two years, there's one director that's been there. His name is Christian. He loves the Lord, and he's passionate to help mm-hmm. these boys. 
they actually use part of their treatment for when we come in because the boys are feeling free to be able to share their stories with us, some of their testimonies with us, and the testimonies of people that come down and share with the boys as well. So it's a, a healing process for these boys. Week after week as we hear their struggles, most of them do not complete the program. They return two or three times. Over the last year, I've had conversations with youth, a couple of youth, Oliver and Juan. Oliver has been growing spiritually. He's been in the program 17 months. He's got one more month left. He's been telling us that he feels like he's called to be a pastor. He will be returning to the States in a month to live with his dad. He wants to join the military and he also would like to be a pastor. So pray for Oliver that he would keep his eyes on Jesus and that seed that's been planted in him that he would continue. Met uh, Juan about uh, t uh, two months ago. And Juan has been, every time we would show up, he'd say, I want to be a part of your ministry. You guys give so much to us. I want to give back to the ministry. This last week uh, on Wednesday, I was at the Youth Rehabilitation Center, and he again was imploring. He said, you guys give so much, I want to give back. I said, how much more time do you have? And he said, I'm there until November. So he's got seven more months to, to go through the program. Pray for Juan that he will finish the program. I said, after you finish, let's talk. But it's so important for him to finish that program. Please pray for Oliver and Juan. And this is where our new adventure begins. Next slide. And I'm just about finished, Tim. This is the last thing. Another 20 <laughs> minutes. Next. Next. Uh, so this is uh, Casa de Mateo. And uh, when your team is in the Dominican Republic, we are uh, going to inaugurate this place. And so we're excited about that. And I think it's July 10th, right? Uh, and so it's not finished. <laughs> But we're going to, I said to our, our team on the ground, if we don't set a date, it will just keep, get, keep pushing forward, you know, back. We'll, we'll do it next month. We'll do it next month. And so the building's up. You know, it's just about done. We need to do some painting. We've got uh, armoires that our furniture factory built. Uh, they're going to be in there probably this week. We bought beds. Uh, we've got the septic tanks in. And, and it's just about done. But pray for us. Because this is a ministry where it's not going to be a rehabilitation. So it's going to be a restoration. We're restoring these young men to be a part of their local community. And so one of our pastors, uh, next slide. And, and so this is, uh, that's a basketball court and uh, right beside uh, the home. And so again, uh, one of our pastors, next slide. Uh, this is Pastor Anai, sitting with Pastor Enrique, and, and Pastor Anai will be the director of our restoration center, Casa de Mateo. And so the cool thing with uh, Pastor Anai, he used to live in the, uh, the United States. He was deported uh, several years ago because he used to be involved in drug trafficking. So I think he knows a little bit about where these young men are coming from. So uh, worship team, if you would come up, and uh, I'm just uh, going to pray for you. Pray that God would uh, allow you to be present where you are at here in New Jersey. Lord.